Thank you very much, uh, Gianluca. I just wanted to explain that the format of the book um, is due to my um, natural, I would say, female chauvinism. Um, women do not have books in their pockets. They have them in their purses. So I always feed the, uh, the size of the book to, to a purse. Like, I, will, I hope to improve and become more symmetrical in that sense. Yes, it is a cover of a small book, Shadowing and Other Techniques for Doing Fieldwork in Modern Societies, which was mostly then incorporated in my newer book, a method book called Social Science Research from Field to Desk, where I have the ambition of covering the uh, research process from the very beginning, choosing your topic, reading your literature, to writing it up. What actually is missing from this part incorporated in the new book is the chapter on specifically in sort of informatics and static technologies. Because it aged so much, it's very interesting. When I was writing this, the book is from 2007, but I was quoting guys who in 2005 were uh, um, working with something that looked very interesting, a device called Reporter with which you could take photos and dictate your comments. And of course, by now, every smartphone can do that. So, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's interesting in that sense how, how things are aging. I will try to, to, to give a sort of go through the variations of these shadowing techniques. Um, so maybe this is a, about the sort of the table of contents that you are sitting here. Maybe we do like that, that I present it, and then we'll return what, to what you consider interesting or uh, worth discussing, or you don't agree with that, and so on and so forth. So uh, you have noticed probably that at least in... Uh, among the so-called qualitative researchers, I'm saying so-called because I think uh, qualitative research is a very unjust uh, description of what our colleagues who are using uh, quantitative techniques do because every research should have quality, not only qualitative research. And also because I think that if there is something interesting to count, we should be counting it. I do think that some qualitative researchers are so qualitative that they don't even count the pages in their dissertation because it would be beyond their qualitative dignity. So I do believe, like Gabriel Tart said, Gabriel Tart, who was very much qualitative and also the director of the first statistical office in, in France, if there is something interesting to count, count it. And actually, I think there are great many interesting things to be counted. Uh, right now, I'm counting the number of women and men quoted in the classics of organization theory. It's a very depressing but a very interesting count. Right. So, uh, within the so-called qualitative research, there's a clearly fashionable to do organizational ethnographies. Well, as I live and work in sort of four languages, and mostly not that which is mine, I do uh, stick to the literal meaning of the word, and ethnography is something that you write, graphy, whereas ethnology is a kind of a knowledge about a, a way of living or the way of working, we can say. And uh, of course, the anthropologists and ethnologists studied exotic tribes, but I think we can also count into it of people working of a profession or even of a community of practice. Uh, interestingly enough, in USA, ethnology is called culture anthropology, whereas in Germany, all anthropology is called ethnology, and this is all because of the sort of historical past that especially the Germans are not very proud of because there was a physical anthropologist, you know, so they don't want to, they want to leave this uh, uh, alone. I don't think ethnology is used so much in uh, uh, UK and Ireland, but I, I may be wrong, but I, I find it the best way to describe what I'm trying to do. It is similar but not identical to social anthropology because social anthropology got into this sort of scientific uh, period and trying to be 
um, very positivistic in what they were doing. But certainly, great many inspirations come from there, not the least from Bronisław Malinowski. Uh, but the product of such a study can be ethnography. You can write an ethnography, but not necessarily. I don't see any problem with doing sort of ethnological field work and then uh, using a, a quantitative technique to, to analyze the results if you think it's, it will give you what you want to know. Uh, why asymmetric ethnology? You, you probably know that I borrowed it from Bruno Latour. He speaks about symmetric anthropology. I prefer the ethnology. But let me begin why the sort of classical uh, anthropological ethnographical studies are, are not anymore, I think, fitting for studying modern societies, which are all. Well, first of all, and this was a British anthropologist, uh, Firth, Raymond Firth, who already in 59 noticed that the anthropologists assume that those tribes they study are like uh, not moving in time. Everything is like it always was and it's always going to be. And he was one of the first who did the same study, repeated the same study after 10 and 20 years. And there were indeed very many changes. Well, uh, German-American anthropologist Johannes Fabian says that the reason for that is the sort of even the, something that people are not aware of, but the assumption that our time, the Western time, goes very quickly, accelerates, but their time, the other's time, goes very slowly. So there's no point to studying changes because, you know, if something changes, it will be for a very long time. And then also this, the movement in space. I mean, those tribes well, okay, the Sami tribes in, in northern Scandinavia, uh, like other nomads, they would move like from one place to another depending on the season, but it were the same places and they will return to the same places, whereas now people are moving everywhere and come back from everywhere. So my ex-doctoral student Lars Stranegot, uh, very much impressed by Gideon Kunda's studies of so-called tech, uh, company uh, decided to study an IT company in Stockholm and found himself a very good place to sit and observe what was hap happening next to the secretary and then he noticed that he could see nothing what was happening. The only thing he could see there were people coming to book a new flight ticket or to complain about the previous flight ticket. Uh, that's the title of the book he's written afterwards, already elsewhere, very interesting and very correct. You can see it, you can, yeah. And also the idea of the participant observation. Again, to mention Bronisław Malinowski, uh, they, he sort of launched it as an idea and as a practice. However, his diaries um, showed that what he meant by participant observation was that during the day he was sitting in the village uh, watching those exotic dances and at three o'clock, no sorry, at five o'clock he went to British Embassy for tea. So not, this is not exactly what should be meant by the participant observation, but if we me meant it literally that you're doing something, you know, these people you are studying are doing. It is not very simple when it comes to professional work because you simply don't have um, competence for that. And it is not even simple because you will get very tired. Uh, one of my uh, publishers actually wanted to write a dissertation about academic publishing and he wanted to do um, sort of self-observation while working and we're thinking about the, w the best way to do it but after a month he gave up because he said he was so tired that you know the idea that when he came back home from work tired already he would start to sort of even I said okay dictate your observation he was too tired even for that and there were children and stuff so it is very trying but some people do it about a symmetric approach, which I think is quite interesting. Well, I have here these three points, the same vocabulary to describe 
truth and lies, successes and failures, attempts and mistakes, that is a judgment-free methodology. I put the methodology in italics because uh, it is not that you are not allowed to make moral judgments, if you wish to, or practical judgments at the end of your study, but not at the beginning. If you know already who is the bad guy and who is the good guy, don't go and study, write about it to a newspaper. It will have a much better spreading. If you know how rotten capitalism is, or on the other side, how um, uh, uh, absurd socialism is, write a political pamphlet. Don't pretend that you don't know and you are going to study, which is what research is about. Research is about learning something that you do not know yet. And then another kind of symmetry, this is I'm presenting a typical ant approach. Uh, well, you can be shadowing men and women, but there are also a lots of machines and lots of objects that are interesting to study. And as we all know, without the STS people pointing it out to us, we tend to forget technologies when they work. But then we put an enormous amount of uh, effort and attention to them when they don't work. So why not to start from the beginning and observe the connection and the dependence on the machines? Uh, there is also interesting idea which actually doesn't come from Anto STS, it's, it's as old as phenomenology, uh, the gradation of existence and the possibility of changing of an ontological status. There are things that are and then they cease to exist. But also things can change things and people can change their status. When you go to a hospital, you become an object on the operating table and you want to be an object. You don't want to have a discussion with your surgeon when you are being operated on. Uh, but also objects that sort of vanish and were b before they were very important and they don't exist anymore. I was actually very surprised to see that. I didn't know they produced them anymore. You know, it's, uh, but they do. And in some places you e can even have the sort of normal you know, overhead projector, which is very good when you have no place to put your thing on, so it's, it can be used this way. Changing status. And then, of course, especially from political point of view, avoiding this a priori distinctions between the um, developed West and, and the developed East, between modern and non-modern countries, between knowledge companies and, I assume, ignorance companies. Or how was it? The high-tech companies, low-tech companies, no-tech companies, and what? What was the other? Yeah. <laughs> But also rationality and irrationality. Rationality can be also local and interesting to study. And identity and alterity. I could tell you quite a lot about the last one, but that will uh, distract me from my main topic, so maybe another time. So to the first, to the first technique, shadowing or field, field work on the move. My inspiration, my personal inspiration, was the Italian sociologist Marianella Sclavi, who wrote a book that exists only in Italian, although she publishes in English as well, One Foot for the, from the Ground. The point was he, she followed her husband who got some job in the States, and their daughter had to go to school. So Marianella followed her daughter to school every day and wrote about the differences between American sc U.S. schools and uh, Italian schools. She, in turn, claimed that she got her inspiration from Truman Capote's uh, story, A Day's Work. I don't know whether you've read it. It is Truman Capote, a white homosexual man who's following, during a day of work, a cleaning woman who is a black hetero person. And the whole f focus of him is sort of noticing the differences and asking her for explanation. It's a very interesting story, but I do not think that you should, take, you should take it as a model for your studies because the story ends with Capote and the cleaning woman uh, smoking hash after which she loses her job. No more sense. 
But I also discovered somewhat later a very interesting sort of um, ideas in uh, Christopher Isherwood's, especially in the Goodbye to Berlin, I am a camera and cabaret. Apparently, I mean, the, the narrator, who is an alter ego of uh, Isherwood, was teaching English in Berlin in the 30s, and he was then now allowed to follow a certain Sally Bowles, who was also an English expatriate of a, let's say, strange status, but having a lot of connections. So following her and seeing through her eyes, as it were, uh, he, was, he said that he was able to see a uh, great many interesting things, among others, the progress of fascism. Observe the sort of micro-focus, big things are hap not, not happening on another planet, big things are happening in micro-locations here and now. But the term, the, the expression shadowing, comes from Harry Walcott's, alas now, uh, late Harry Walcott, because he did, um, okay, he was one of those anthropologists who were kicked out of exotic countries and had to come home and fight a job. This was before anthropologists got the jobs at business schools, so uh, he decided to go in sort of a sociology or pedagogic, what was it, and to use his talents or competences. So what he did, he followed a principal, a school principal, for a year. And the other people in the school uh, was started calling him the shadow because at the same time there was a radio program they called the shadow, so they thought it was very funny if they would start calling him. And he took it up and called it shadowing. After they observed that the book, original book, was from 1973, but he was sort of rediscovered in the uh, 90s, and he then produced two books, Ethnography is a Way of Seeing and the Art of Fieldwork. But also some people, or quite a few people, were using it without using the term shadowing. Um, Daniel Miller, who I found a very interesting uh, researcher of, I mean, he, studied, he studies marketing from an anthropological point of view. Um, his theory of shopping is extremely interesting, I think. What he claims is against the sort of common idea that consumerism is a horrible disease. He says that the shopping is mostly, mostly an altruistic uh, activity because we shop for others. It turned out, he did the studies in the UK, that uh, buying food didn't count as shopping at all because that was normal thing, my necessary thing to do. Whereas any other shopping was always done with somebody else or even with anybody but in, with somebody else in mind. So that my husband will like it or my friends will be, uh, will be saying that this is nice and so on and so forth. And he started, uh, if I remember correctly, in, the, the, in this book, one couple, one couple to be, which was very interesting, and then I think two single persons, something like that. Very interesting. I did shadowing for the first time when I was studying uh, big cities, big city management, um, and I did it in the three cities I studied, and in Stockholm it was very easy and very pleasant, no problem. Uh, I was sh shadowing three different people in Warsaw and it had its problems, which I described with great delight in the book. But it was very interesting. There was no chance of doing shadowing in Rome because in generally the idea was, at least at that time, I don't know whether it changed, that A, professors do not do field work. It's only students who do field work. If a professor comes in and do, does field work, there's something wrong with that professor. And at any rate, what do they care about what a Swedish uh, researcher is going to tell about them? So I needed a lot of help from my friends to get access at all, and the only thing I could do were interviews. So uh, if I take this shadowing as following another person, I think it has very important advantages because it's sort of, it's a way of doing research, as I'm saying here, 
that really mirrors the mobility of contemporary life. Because, you know, you, when you sit at the secretary's office, people come and go, but it's very fragmented and you really don't know what, how to put it together. If you follow a person, this person will explain you to happens and you will be confronted with great many things on the way, as it were. So in that sense, it's like with Sally Bowles, they are the cameras. You see, you are allowed to see the work you are studying uh, or activity you are studying through their eyes. And I think it does offer a unique opportunity to, to understand the differences between oneself and the others, like in Truman Capote things. But well, I, I shouldn't say that disadvantages, difficulties would, should be a more proper expression. It requires constant attention and continuous ethical decisions. What do I do? If, I, if there's something wrong going on, should I intervene or not? Uh, what do I do? Do, do? do I make them tea or coffee or is it the wrong you know, positioning? When I had problems even in Warsaw, I put my coat on the fur coat of the um, economic director and the secretary removed it from that. So, you know, there's small and big things that you constantly have to make decisions about, which in a normal sort of uh, routine day you don't even think about it. And it's psychologically uncomfortable, but as I was probably saying in the previous talk, uh, when, when you feel psychologically uncomfortable, it means that you're learning something new. When you feel comfortable, go home, okay? Then something that I will take very briefly because I was speaking about it more, uh, how to study people, who, how to shadow people who are sitting for most of the day at their computers. So this is how the locals, as it were, the practitioners taught me to do when I was studying the Italian news agency ANSA. Of course I was doing everything else. That's another thing. Do uh, learn from Rosa Kanter, who when she presented the methods and techniques of her study, she made like a list of 10 methods, which means that whatever she did was a method. So every con conversations were separate from interviews and so on and so forth. So it makes a very good expression, uh, impression when you sort of list it like that. But in fact, as everybody field worker knows, I mean, we're constantly doing a lot of things. Yeah, well, there is, there is a formal interview and you have questions, but there are lots of conversations. Uh, you were directly observing what is happening, but if you are allowed to take photos, it's even better, and so on and so forth. So, uh, as I said, these people were sort of uh, completely tied to their screens of all kinds. This is a computer screen, but they also had a, you know, like Reuters, is all the walls are covered with screens of various kinds. Uh, so, you've seen this, some of you have seen this before. They gave me simply two screens, those that you see here in the corner. On one of the screens, I could see so-called desk, which, I mean, virtual desk, on which they were doing their work, daily work. And on the other screen, I could see the results, the news wire. Of course, I couldn't do anything, but it was very good to me. And also, as you can see, I could do direct observation, I was seeing who was coming in, who was going out, who, what they were talking about, and so on and so forth. Also, what was easy is because I discovered they do it to, to themselves constantly. I mean, they look over their shoulders for, to discuss what, how things should be done, not should be done, or something like that. So much to my, my surprise, it was a very easy and quite pleasant thing to do. So I do think, and it's, it's going for more and more professions, that this kind of observation of computer work is necessary in studies exactly of those professionals who work basically through computers. And it does permit simultaneous direct observation, because you could say, I can do it at the distance, but if you are there, you are doing both. You are watching the screen and you are watching the people. It does need specific technical equipment, 
in that case was multiple screens. But also, and we can discuss it, but, but maybe I'm wrong, but I think that this kind of computer work must be somewhat routinized. Uh, because, you know, I don't know how would you feel if somebody, especially, you know, your TV advisor was standing behind your, you know, behind you watching on your screen. Uh, I would get very irritated, to say the least, and one could they, you know. So, I think that it's important that this, this was something normal for them. They're used to it. Uh, some people can get used to it, but uh, I do think there must be, a, you know, the the more creative the work, the mo more m difficult would be to study it that way. But I would be happy to be corrected. Yeah. Yes. Mm. It's a standard question asked about field work for centuries now. Uh, usually they, they are aware of my um, presence for about 10 minutes and after that it goes, you know, if you go there for one day and vanish, yes. But if you go there for at least, I usually go for 10 days, but you know, people are going for the, uh, they get used to it. But also it does influence what they are saying, for example, and this is very interesting because they present to you what you learn is what they want to be presented as their work, you know. So it's it's like like David Silverman said, we are living in the uh, with with Thoreau the, in the interview era, so they are very much used to it. So it's it's interesting because they it goes in variations, like. When I was doing the, studying the city of Rome, they were, when I was interviewing, the, the higher I interviewed, the more I got the same interviews they were giving to the journalists. So I was going there only to, make, to please them because I knew that I would learn nothing. But the more down you go, you, you get at least two versions. One is the official version, one is the counter version. Actually, the, my Danish colleagues are now uh, editing a book called Counter Narratives, so it's a, uh, you know, or else official version with unofficial comments. So, you know, you, you get this kind of studies. Uh, I believe, maybe wrongly, in when describing what they do, I believe more in my eyes than in their descriptions of their do. Because, as you remember from, from uh, RJS and Schoen, there is something like espoused theory and theories in use. So not that they are lying, because why would they bother to the first place, in the first place, unless it's a very tricky business, but they truly may believe that what they are doing is not exactly what they are doing. But, if I may quote Rote, with not, not exactly because I don't remember the exact quote, we have to, we, it's our duty to listen to these stories and take them seriously, not because they may have to be correct, but because they're human beings to which we owe respect and interest. So, what I didn't tell you in the f previous talk is that I was not allowed to do shadowing in the Swedish uh, uh, news agency. They, the explanation was that they were too small and this was an open uh, landscape office, so it will, be, yeah, it will be disturbing if I was there shadowing and going places. So for a moment I, I, I didn't know what to do, but I said, okay, can I interview people? And I interviewed practically all people I wanted to interview. But here were my questions. Could you please tell me what you did yesterday or today if it was at the end of the day? And I thought that it will be, you know, like if you ask me what I did today, I would hardly remember it. But they, they opened the notebook, but the first thing I noticed when I came to answer, there was a pile of notebooks, A4, on the floor. I mean, they were using like one per day. And, you know, whoever asked this open said, right, yesterday, at eight I did this, at seven, amazing. Uh, they don't use, uh, you know, the um, uh, digital calendars for that, they do for, for other things. And then simply, was it a typical day? And do you remember any 
unusual events in your work. I, I really like the sort of critical incident uh, comments on that. So, and what I was allowed to do is to, to do a photo reportage. So I started with, this is the entrance. This is a typical working place. Uh, this was a place for more morning meetings. I have to adm admit that I am a bit sh shy, so there are no people because I didn't dare to do it with people. I probably they wouldn't have anything to do against it, but I, I didn't want to ask. And this was very funny because in, it was the desk, the one literal desk, because as you see, it is a table, it is a desk, but this was where the editorial room was meeting every morning. So the, the boss would be sitting or rather standing nearby this chair and they would go around, stand around it. Also, this enormous number of screens of all kind. This is, you cannot read it in Swedish, but it, as you can see, the uh, very uh, specific times, uh, various sources of news and then deciding what is happening on the web. So this, even if I didn't, couldn't follow it on the screen like in ANSA, I could follow it on the big screen which was showing the production, the news wire for everybody who wanted to see. Also, I was uh, almost shocked at the number of telephones of all kinds. The, okay, the one was antique, this was from the times when they started, and there were any kind of, of uh, telephones in between. Because we are all speaking about computers, but at least in sort of in news agencies, the telephones were as important, if not more important. I'm saying sort of joking about cybergs that depending if you're left-handed or right-handed, the, the computer is your right hand and the telephone is your left hand, or the other way around. So, well, I knew this technique even before, I used to call them observant participation in the sense that you ask the actual practitioners to observe themselves what they are doing. But I discovered that uh, the, uh, our US colleagues had a very much better um, descriptions. They call it a diary interview. And in fact, when I was using it in Sweden for the first time, I was coming like every two weeks to uh, one municipality, one um, insurance office, and yeah, two municipalities and one insurance office. So after, <coughs> after a while, they started running diaries, so they, they knew what to tell me when I would ask them what they did last week. And also, this is my biggest success as a field researcher. At the end, one of the women at the, actually the governmental office said, you know, because of your study, I'm going to change my job. And I said, how come? Well, I discovered I don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I think it, it's, you know, you get a very, it, it's again, they are not telling you their opinions. They may add to it, but it is like a reporting of what, what they have done. It is a self-observation. So, I think it's a, it's a very good sort of record of the activity. And then when interviewing, you can ask for explanations, comments, and so on and so forth. Uh, what, again, the difficulties, it could be that obtaining the cooperation may not be easy um, because it, it's an additional work as it, as it is. But here I must say that in Sweden, A, all uh, public sector uh, organizations are open to researchers by definition. So I must say that in smaller municipalities you sometimes uh, meet more, I mean, more numerous are researchers than the workers because I usually will meet somebody from political scientists, uh, sciences, somebody from social work, uh, somebody from psychology possibly and so on and so forth. So we are great many observing those poor people who are, but they cooperate. But as I mentioned it, it was not so easy in Warsaw or in, in, in Rome. And finally, the peculiar thing about how to follow objects. Uh, well, I'm not mentioning the one thing that perhaps I should mention. I'm sort of following or shadowing documents, following documents because 
I assume you know how to, I mean, this is easy, I mean, sort of you, you sh follow the same kind of regulation or law or whatever from one place to another and see how it is changing. But what I found fascinating is what my one Norwegian colleague and one Italian colleague uh, did together. It's about the travels, they, they were shadowing a st stockfish. This is, by the way, the, I think, very nice um, watercolor of our best watercolorist, slash Lorraine. A bit of advertisement for this. So, okay, this is cod or called scray in, in Norwegian, sometimes stockfish and stockfish too. Uh, there's a lots of information that you really don't need, but just that you know what fish it is. And here it starts, what they were sort of following. First, there's a nature as a supplier. That is, there's fishing, and they're fishing various methods, but uh, mostly, as you can see, with a big net that collects the fish. What happens then is that people and machines take over. Uh, you see the, you know, they are being processed in the sense preparing for drying. Also the most, the parts that cannot be dried but can be consumed uh, are removed. What you see on this maybe not so uh, appetizing picture is actually the best part of a cod. It's a tongue which is removed and it's a best, Norwe I mean sort of most famous, Norwe one of the famous Norwegian dishes. And then nature gets to work again. The processed fish is hung on those as you can see it, constructions, and uh, hoping for the weather, but th they know where the weather is and not, not is good for, for that. They s simply hang until they are dry. When they are dry, it comes back to people and machines, and also, because as, as you can see, the Italy is the sort of the biggest importer from Norway, the Italian specialists come at the end of the drying season and check whether the fish is properly dried. And then the sort of amazing uh, kind of profession, if I may say so, uh, the sorter. Apparently, it goes in family and there are only very special people who do it because you have to have a smell and decide what, fish, what category of fish it is. And you know that they're sometimes caught with two heads. It's very interesting. They, they don't go for consumption. They're kept. There is a knighthood of stockfish if you ever wanted to join, at, at least in Italy. So they have this kind of uh, exhibits there. But as you see, there are sort of categories, um, at least on the, this picture, there are nine or ten categories of, of the fish. And then stockfish hits the road. Observe the interesting packaging. They are sort of pressed into something that can be nicely packed and sent. And it goes to Italy. This Festa del Bacala means the, you know, the, the festival of the stockfish. It is from the 27th to the 29th September every year. And there's a lot of activities. There is, of course, selling and buying. Uh, there is a cooking, and this is a long cooking because you, first you have to keep them in the water for, no, so they are not dry anymore. And then there is eating, and then there is dancing, and there's gatherings of people, and there is a lot of marketing of various organizations, and so on and so forth. So what they were saying here is that Stockish starts making culture. But also, this kind of connections, which I call the action net, lead to networks that become stabilized in more or less formal organizations. So, yeah, well, uh, I translated here as brotherhood of Bacala, but it's really knighthood of Bacala. No, at least there is a knight of Bacala. Uh, there are twin cities between Italy and Norway. There is school exchange. You will be surprised how many uh, people in small island uh, in Lofoten and Norway speak Italian. Uh, there are um, 
caritative organizations like Proloco, the artistic association like Artscape Norland, there is a fish industry association, they are the sellers and so on and so forth. So what was interesting you know, in the, in the uh, summaries is that thanks to this stockfish uh, trade, thanks to the travels of, of the fish, uh, at least two municipalities can get very clear identities. This is the island of Rost, a pearl farthest out in Lofoten. The annual production of 24 million, that was set in, in 2005. I, I don't exactly know how it is now. But also, the, 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 in the small uh, town, village, and the small island it stands for 30% or 25 to 30% of the stockfish annually imported to Italy. And they do have competitors, Iceland, for example, and another island. But it also, for the Italian village, capital of the Bacala alla Vicentina, which is a kind of a dish they are specializing. And the, the, their province was among the top of Italy's highest earners and the highest concentration of small and medium enterprises in Europe. And they were sort of presenting themselves, marketing themselves as the industrial district of, of, of a third way. That was the popular and the thumb. So uh, I think it's very interesting to not only to, to shadow people, but to follow both objects and quasi-objects because it is, again, the ethnography on the move, because not only people travel, things, ideas travel as well. But then you, you have to, the problem is that you, you have to constantly renew, the, you start again to negotiate the access. But in a sense, I think myself that I'm exaggerating in that way that really each field work requires a daily renegotiation of access because, you know, you, they allow you to do the observation for 10 days and on the third day they say that actually they're too busy, that's happened to me, uh, you should go home, and so on and so forth. Or they allow to you to shadowing like I did in the Stockholm energy production plant, but I couldn't go to the uh, personal, personnel interviews, which I think is right because why should I be listening to, but you know, so there is this constant renegotiation. But obviously, if you go from one place to another and from one country to another, you have to still write your letters, say, please could I, and so on and so forth. So it takes time and effort, but what doesn't? Finally, how to write it up? There are great many ways to writing it up. So this is why I'm saying, uh, well, this was a, a term I, I wanted to learn, ergonography, because ergon is a, means work in Greek and organize instruments, so I thought it was a very good term. Um, I was launching in a book from 97, and John Van Manen was my, um, was my uh, reviewer, and he said it will never catch because it's a very ugly word. He was right. Although, on the other hand, I've learned recently that when August Comte coined the term sociology, he thought it will never catch because it's such an ugly word and see what happens, so one never knows. At any rate, what you can do is actually the describe of what I'm calling action net in the sense not of a specific organization, but the actions even between and among organizations that are existent or emergent. I'm quoting here uh, uh, two persons who wrote them together, but Tatiana Pippen studied the uh, organization of uh, Jubilee, the millennium, uh, the third millennium Jubilee in Rome, and Lena Poshande studied the Stockholm as a culture capital. Um, so it was, it was very interesting to study something that was emerging that didn't exist before. Uh, one could do a sort of et metaphoric ethnography. I say Pasquale Gagliardi is very good at that. He describes the actions actually of, of, of actual organizations, what they do, but puts most effort in sort of comparing them 
to something else that would be metaphorically um, convincing, persuasive. Well, um, I think that Kunda is uh, as close to the sort of ethnography of an organization that you could, well, I don't know, because the, I assume you've, you've read his book, and if not, do, because it's very interesting. He had several editions for good reason. But what, what is missing for me in Guidon's book, I mean, it's not a, I mean, you cannot do everything, but he never says what the engineers in tech do. He, he describes all the rest of the, the, the company, uh, um, but not the, prof the work of professionals. Then, you know, a kind of a case study that is a case of some phenomenon that you find of interest. Uh, I was thinking actually about uh, project projectography because there apparently projectification is going on. I mean, most organizations are sort of changing their way of organizing into projects that are going on, stopping new projects starting, and so on and so forth. And they could be presented differently uh, as a, you know, the difference, a detective story, a suspense story. In a detective story, you know that a crime has been committed and you have to find out who. So, Aramis, or the story of, of a machine that was not loved enough by Latour, is a typical detective story because it starts with the question, who killed Aramis? Mm, Tony Spiber, a while ago, has written a very interesting dissertation, actually, about uh, uh, the changes in the wool industry in the UK. And this is a suspense story in the sense that you don't know what is going to happen, but you feel with each chapter that something interesting is going to happen. It's a very interesting story of a change made because of a crisis that could have happened. There were the, the old owners of the wool um, companies in the UK died and their children took over and under the sort of influence of the management and business, uh, Propaganda, they said that if we don't change it, we will have a crisis. So it was very interesting from that point of view. A photo reportage, a movie. Well, you probably s have seen, because it's circulating Facebook, uh, the news that a graphic novel has been accepted as a doctor dissertation in the US. So I think the future looks rosy for us. Yeah, so this was basically what I was going to present. I'm sort of sorry for, for going through it quickly, but I think that now we can go back to whatever you think is worth going up. Yes. Oh, I'm very sorry for anything wrong I said. I mean, incorrect I said about this. <laughs>
Right. Uh, it's a lot of questions, as you understand, but they are all very re relevant, I think. Uh, in the book, I'm quoting uh, the Dutch, I uh, think, yes, anthropologists who introduced this interesting idea of studying from under, over, and from the side, you know, uh, in relation to the people you are studying. So, for example, my friend is a sociologist who studied for most of her life, like unemployed women, uh, you know, immigrants, at a certain point decided to study politicians, women politicians. And she told me, you know, you know what happened? One of them told me to come to Stockholm from Lund, you know how it is, and I waited one hour and a half because she was too busy. So we were just, uh, and there are some, you know, uh, some papers on that actually that take it up that uh, where you think that you are getting access because because it's obvious and you are such a pleasant person actually you are getting access because these people think that you can help them whereas other people like this uh, people in, in Rome municipality couldn't care less so I was also in the situation of waiting you know 30 hours 30 minutes I remember the e interview with a person who was my age, who was a friend of my friend, and I had to w wait for like 35 minutes, and then she gave me 20 minutes, which was nothing to what I needed, so I said, when will we meet again? And she said, I hope never. <laughs> so, so I have to admit I was crying on the bus going home. So yes, but I think it's also very important to, to understand this exactly, so this under, so, you know, what are, on what level are you? Are you starting from under, from above, or from a side? Uh, having said that, it sounds like studying from under is not very good, but it has its advantages. Can I, if I can be uh, forgiven another piece of female uh, chauvinism, uh, it's very good to be a young woman when you are doing field work because most of these men with great pleasure will explain to you, okay, then afterwards the older woman said, the life is explained to me by men, you know this famous article, but in our research actually it's very good. Whereas I've seen uh, one of the first studies when I was actually a methodological consultant, I had a pair, an economist and uh, a psychologist, and it we didn't mean it like that, but it's usually an economist was a man and the psychologist was a woman. So the interviewees were doing these diary interviews, were very happy to explain everything to women, but then they would go like in sort of um, competitive dialogue with, if the guy asked them something, they say, don't they teach that you in the school of economics? You know, so it is, so in that sense, like, you know, uh, it's mostly moral choices in the sense that I don't think you can make a sort of ethical code for field work other than, you know, respect the people you are meeting and try to behave uh, decently and politely because every time you have to decide what to do. I mean, whether to be unpleasant to somebody who is trying to put you down or not, whether to be meek or to be aggressive or whatever, so that's, that's it. But about class, I mean, you mean social class as such, yeah. Yeah, this is very interesting. Uh, not, it's, it, well, it's sort of, when you study people, I mean, f from the sort of upper classes, uh, they very often are sort of condescendingly uh, cooperative. It's much more difficult than to study from the above. I mean, if you've read all this discussion about um, Alice Goffman's study recently, you know, the Goffman's, his daughter or granddaughter? Daughter, yeah. He spent a very long time with the, with the guys, you know, doing drugs and doing various things. And, the, you know, there's 
so much fuss about it. So she got accepted. The problem was not that she was not accepted, but then now the various kinds of accusation that she um, uh, went native. I mean, uh, she's one of them that by doing her study and not reporting to the police, she is against. So any, any kind of stuff. So, well, basically, field work is never easy, but I think it, it gives an interesting results. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> but actually, and also I think that many my colleagues, anthropologists who study sort of business issues or finance, uh, they say uh, it's very good that they are not supposed to know anything because there is not this evoking sort of, you know, I don't need to explain to you, but I need to explain to you. But they, you know, but they, usually they're flattered by, by the interest. So that works quite well. But then, yeah, speaking about writing it up, I was thinking about it because, you know, there was a whole uh, wave of publications after the financial crisis. And they came from, from different sources. So the economists who are famous for doing their models and, and using quantitative techniques and being very sort of formalized, I mean, some of them write beautifully and they convince everybody, you know, they, they're fantastic books uh, written by economists. On the other hand, when my friends, organization sociologists, put together a book exactly of the crisis of finance, it, it was a pain to read it, and what I didn't know is whether they do it because it was scientific as it were. You know the book by Michael Billing, uh, Learn How to Write Badly or How to Succeed in Social Sciences, very good book. Um, or whether they thought it was too difficult because they had to, to learn so many technical details that were unknown to them that it was difficult for them to sort of present it in an easy way or because they wanted to impress with this sort of technical uh, knowledge. So it, it is interesting when the sort of um, different disciplines, it's not within the discipline but you go to practitioners who are doing something else. I don't know whether I... Yeah, okay. Yeah, that, yeah, we, uh, yeah, I know what you mean. It's a tricky business. I, my sort of rule is to tell the truth, but not necessarily the whole of it, okay? So I'm not lying ever with those letters or introductions, but it's not. But also, to my defense, if you think it's, it's immoral to do so, I'm very often wrong about what I should be studying. As I was saying with the previous previous talk, I wanted to see how they managed the, the overflow of coming information. There was no such a problem whatsoever. So, you know, so I'm trying to be general and, yeah, as I said, truthful, but not going into details. Oh, okay. Could you keep, keep order? I think there are... Yeah, I think Andrea was here, yeah. Uh, you, you, you told us about the, the fishing, for example. 
Yeah, yeah, I've noticed, or somebody pointed out, they sort of, I jump over the analysis, but I don't jump over analysis in the method book, so you, you, I go into various possibilities and details. Well, I think what is very important is to find a way of analyzing that suits you, because there are great many equally good, but, you know, uh, some people say, you know, like, uh, well, first of all, I think that grounded theory has one of the, one of the most important positive aspects of grounded theory is that it says, not very realistically, but it's good to remember, is that don't uh, wait until you collected so much field material that it sort of uh, takes three uh, shelves in your thing and you don't know where to start, what to do. When you've the f you start your analysis when you've done your two first interviews or your first two observation days, and then you continue. Of course, as we sometimes have to book like four interviews a day and then we're tired, whatever, but you know, generally, start as soon analyzing as possible. And then how to do it? Well, I think that from what I judge from the students tell me is that some people are very insecure if they don't have any kind of sort of cut tool that will allow them to categorize it. I don't do it like that. What I do is I simply read my observation, I mean my field notes or my interview notes and associate and write on the margin, actually on paper this time, uh, on the margin whatever you know, association I have. <coughs> and then, when they, when they are repetitive, then I have another sort of, no, I mean, I'm noting possible categories. And then, when I'm done with that, the, the next step is, of course, to answer the question how the categories are related to, to one another, which is the true piece of theory. But I also think that, again, for people who do it like me, it's a very good thing to use the software at the end to check whether you are not sort of projecting your own priorities on it. Because I had a student in Finland, she was studying the marketing, the development of historic, history of marketing in Finland, and she thought there was a very important category in the interviews she had, and then she she ran in vivo or whatever it was, and turns out there was a minus minuscule. She thought it was very important. So it's very good to sort of to, to check frequencies or, you know, uh, the, at the end if you want to. But some people, because remember, in vivo, any non software will tell you what it means. It will simply tell you what are the most used words. And yeah, as you know, when you, when you do this, this fancy collections of words, you have to remove like the end and all that to, to get something sensible similar there. So yeah, maybe th these are the most used words because they're fashionable. Maybe everybody is blah blahing this way, you know, buzzwords or whatever. It means not necessarily anything. So, but, but for some people it is a good thing to sort of start with it the set of analytical categories. They could be taken from another theory if there is a theory. Although, if there is a theory of the phenomenon you want to study, I think that either you, uh, you study another phenomenon, because that one is already explained, or else if the theory for some reason you think does not apply to, to whatever you are studying, the site, the time, whatever, then you have to test it. But that's a, sort of another matter if there is a theory. But then, you know, it depends, I mean, and this is what you should check on yourself, whether you like to have it pre-structure or whether you can permit yourself that the structure will be emerging from your analysis. It, I think it's a very sort of personal preference. It's also, I think, very good to to like uh, cooperate with people who have a different way of, of looking at it like doing work together and, you know, one is doing it that way, another is doing it that way, and... Uh, <laughs> What organizations? Uh, uh, voluntary organizations. Yeah. So these tend to be extra work, ad hoc, not routinized. So doing field work is very difficult for these teachers. They work when they want to work. And it's very difficult to find them. I was wondering what advice you might have for doing these sort of field work with these kinds of organizations. Hmm. 
But it's very surprising because, you know, my people in Sweden, people tell me that these are the easiest to study because they're so um, willing to help. Uh, you, uh, did you have? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So probably this sort of diary interview would be the best. Like if they tell you that they have done something and then you can ask them, you know, what, was, what, is, what it was. Oh, one of the techniques that is in, is in this chapter that was omitted from the newer method book was that the people, it was, you know, they were studying like how people are using smartphones or how people are using with computers. And that was something which was very ingenious, but I think I would be also very irritated with that. They got a software that uh, buzzed regularly at certain times, and whenever they heard that, they were supposed to report in the software what they were doing at this very moment. So it's a Yeah, but you know, if you can get them, it, it, it is very interesting, you know, when you start thinking about, if you can get them to sort of like report to you that they just have done something and then tell you about what they've done. That's what I'm, if anybody have a better idea or another idea, it's always good. Well, yeah, you get your you, you you get back at them describing exactly in details what they did and what they didn't do. That's true, but you know it does happen. I mean, people in in the field. It's again like I told you before that the Swedish public sector organisation have to guarantee access. But when this when the wave of privatisation started. So now they're companies owned by municipalities, but they treat themselves as private companies. So the first thing they did, they, uh, they uh, denied access. Not because, of it, just to show that they are real companies, not the you know, public sector thing. So, you know, all that happens. But I do think it's, again, it's, it's a moral choice. I do think that sort of paying back is, is allowed. Uh, my, my friend and colleague from Stockholm who wrote about decision-making in, in the Swedish government uh, on ecological matters sent the, uh, the sketch of his dissertation to one of the ministers and he wrote a very unpleasant letter to him. He included the letter in the dissertation with his commentary. So it's, you know, no. But yeah, it does happen and it's, you know. Uh, I don't remember that I did, but I wouldn't exclude it if it's sort of, you know, they have their own ideas and sort of. Then another thing is very interesting, sort of to anonymize or not. Because, you know, uh, mostly people are happy that you will anonymize them. And actually I, I keep to it, I sort of, I, I'm sending the not complete reports so that, you know, one, one guy told me, you were quoting my joke, everybody heard it, everybody will know it's me, so I had to remove the joke, even if it was very funny. And, uh, uh, but I think the main problem is that those who do not want to be anonymized, because they expect sort of free marketing, as it were, and so we're saying, no, sorry, we're not doing that, so, yeah, maybe you can. So, and the point is, of course, that, you know, it's, it's, it's legally should be impossible to prove who you were studying and this sort of. Sorry, there. Uh, is it? Earlier uh, in your presentation, you mentioned uh, the symmetrical ethnography. You talked Ethnology. about the mm -hmm. controlled vocabulary. So you can study like truth and lies, honest and dishonest, good and bad, that kind of thing. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. What is the purpose of that? What do you think it imposes any restrictions on what you're doing? 
Mm, yes, as I say, this is very much uh, STS, that part of STS that was very much influenced by anthropology and was both inspired by its technique but sort of remember, uh, seeing very clearly its colonial imperialist sort of uh, background. But at present, I also mostly uh, discuss or quarrel, if you, if you will, with my critical management colleagues. Uh, well, we, we understand the word critique differently because I understand critique in terms of, re as related, as refer to, referring to management like a theatre critique in the, in the sense that if something is bad, I can say it, but if something is good, I can say it as well. But on the other hand, uh, much in, within the critical management thing is they know from the beginning what is bad. And the whole thing is only to sort of prove it once again. But as I said, if it has been proved, well, save your breath and do something else. Uh, so that's, that's the, the, the main problem. At the end, yes, at the end, you may even have to go to the police to, to say, what you, to report what you have seen, whatever, if this is a, a, a serious problem. But if you come there, well, in other words, is avoid prejudices. And, the, you know, um, and there were so many things about it. The last point here is, is again the same thing, you know, studying these underdeveloped countries. Well, now we call them developing countries, but we, we know what we mean. And, uh, but even, you know, um, talking to women instead to men, I mean, this, this kind of stuff. So trying to be really symmetrical from the very beginning. And then you are allowed, so in that sense, a judgment-free methodology that does not prefer. Well, actually, still about the, you know, like studying upper classes, for example. But another matter, which I think now computers, you've seen probably the, the things wrote about netnography. This is what I'm quoting in the method book as well, because it came after. Uh, some people prefer not to be interviewed by, but answer the mail, be interviewed by email. And some people hate writing on the me email and would prefer telephone interviews or something like that. It's like with us. I mean, some of us prefer to talk to people face to face, some of us not. I have a, a colleague who is a professor of many years now. He hates talking to people. He does everything on telephone. So it's, uh, you know, so this kind of, this kind of thing, trying to avoid especially sort of moral, but even the judgments from the point of view of productivity, effectiveness is something, uh, or, you know, assuming that management is always doing stupid things and the unions are always right. I mean, it could be the other way around, believe it or not. Yeah, it's Yoke, but I really cannot, you know, I'm I don't. Who, who it is in terms of yeah, I don't remember his surname, but you know, um, Gianluca, you have the, at least the, the, this book, the shadowing book, so I, I'm quoting it there. Not really, because, you know, I came in, especially in the cities and even in the... I came as a professor of management. So it was, I think, more sideways, I mean, the sort of... Uh, uh, you want to join, yeah? Yeah, I think so. Ah, no, Ulf Hannertz too. It's, uh, he's an, a Swedish anthropologist. Yeah. 
but Ulf did get it from Joke Schreider. I, I simply don't remember the surname, so you know he's quoting her as well. And so. I have another suggestion because it so happened that in my university there is a big thing. We, we are cooperating with the mm, art faculty. We have something like business and design. But also I was e involved in an um, initiative that produces a journal that may be of interest to you. It's called Parsi. That is Platform for Artistic Research in Sweden. And the E is added because it's as E is the Sweden thing. So. Uh, they are like <coughs> several issues. I find them interesting. Also, but this is not you, what you will be studying because my colleagues have edited a book called Artistic Interventions, but this is about the artist coming into business and doing things. So it's not you. You will be studying what they are doing. I, yeah, um, I think there are more and more people who are doing that. I mean, sort of both from inside as you, and they sort of. Uh, Yeah, you, you need a sort of portion of estrangement, as it were. Mm -hmm. It's to just come up with a, um, some tools to help me with that estrangement. Mm, right, okay. Yeah, but I think uh, it's more and more people are doing that, so it's a, it's a very interesting new, new thing. I'm not sure that the research is not free, but the problem is rather than when you produce the results and what they say about it. So I had a doctoral student who studied a project in Volvo, and one of the uh, important conclusions in her dissertation was that it was a totally masculine uh, environment, that they were using m military metaphors all the time and expressions. It was very funny because when she presented it, what we call the last seminar, my male colleague didn't know what she was speaking about. Doesn't everybody speak like that? You know, it's a, um, and the reaction was very sort of, uh, they said, nonsense, no such a thing. She misunderstood everything. There is nothing like that. Two months later, for no reason whatsoever, Volvo started project Women's Car. <laughs> so the point is, and I've seen it quite a few times, you know, we, I still at least, you know, even though I should know better, we expect that when we do a good job, they will thank us for it. Well, not really. They will thank us if they, we delivered what they wanted us to deliver. Now, if we didn't, you know, maybe some people would be thankful, unlike the other people, but I think that's, that's the problem. And the point, the, the point is that it's, it's okay, but the problem could be that they, you know, they can, can be then stop fa further financing or something. But you know, in good old times, or at least so the US historians say, the business schools were funded by businessmen who wanted to be criticized because they thought that if nobody criticized them, they will be forever repeating the same errors and will never get better. But as all fairy tales, it doesn't have to be, you know, related to reality. Sorry for that. <laughs> But yeah, a positive thing. Things change, you know, but that is also very important for you, I think, as doctoral students. You think that nowadays you have to, 
to, to write, to publish papers. Believe me, in 10 years, you will be required to publish books. So it's best to, to learn how to do both. Because, you know, I already seen it in like, you know, there was a, a person looking for a promotion at Harvard Business School and that person only had papers, but I thought it was very good and very competent. I said, well, it's very doubtful whether that person will get it because now everybody can publish a paper every, everywhere. It's writing books that count. And I know for sure that in Israel, it's an it's a iron rule. You cannot be promoted to associate professor, and especially the full professor, without writing a book. You can publish your papers, and it's very nice, but the book is a book. So, you know, try to... It is very much like the sort of accounting techniques. I mean, we, our students very often believe that they, what they learn about accounting techniques right now will last forever. And then they go to a company in five years, it's a completely different fashion, completely different techniques, and they're very disappointed, both sides, because we didn't teach them the new one. We couldn't teach them a new one because we didn't know it will come. But our duty is, as it were, to teach people to learn new things and not to believe that their learning right now will last forever, because it never does. But sorry, who? About analyzing the data. Yeah, but, but did you quote some name? I'm sort of. No, no, I was just thinking that. Yeah, you know, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of the bit associating game with game and driving theory, uh, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what sort of bits can go to, to, to develop the theoretical contribution of, of the research. Mm. Yeah. I, th I think, I thought it was only a Swedish phenomenon, but I find it in many places. There are like two different meanings, at least two different meanings of the word theory. Actually, my, my colleague edited a book called What is Theory? with the contributions from various disciplines. Very interesting because everybody has a completely different idea what uh, theory is. Also, oh, by the way, I think that um, uh, Richard Svedberg did a very good job editing a book where you find Jim March and Karin Knorsetina in about theorizing in social sciences. Because w what I f see as a sort of a, a problematic mix-up is a theory as, a, as an approach, as a theoretical framework, let's say institutionalism or actor network theory, um, yeah, like Latour said, actual net theory, it's uh, the actor is wrong, the, the network is wrong, the theory is wrong, and even the hyphen is wrong. I don't know why hyphen, but still in there. Uh, and theory as to exactly theorizing, as a theory explaining, presenting and explaining some phenomenon. So, you know, so you, you choose a theoretical framework, but you are to produce a theory, which is this theorizing. And yeah, so I think how, so when you're doing analyzing, you are doing theory, oh, you were going towards theorizing. Because, you know, from, from this sort of analytical work, you are supposed to, to come with this set of categories and then to connect them so it makes sense and explain the phenomenon that you have been studying. Easier said than done, but, uh, but an interesting stuff. But, uh, yeah, what I think, but who cares what I think, I mean, this sort of, this new um, uh, requirement in, in many, in the uh, manuscript central is that you are supposed to say what is contribution. It's ridiculous. You are not supposed to say what is contribution. Your readers are supposed to say what is your contribution. But you know what, what I mean. It's always says, so what is your contribution? Well, how should I know? Sorry, John. Mm -hmm. No. And the one in that sense, can you explain a little bit to me how you therefore unpack the complexity and the dynamics in your studies? How do you make sense of them? 
I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry why I'm <laughs> speaking to that microphone. Well, yeah, I sort of make sense to us. Oh, one of the first, when I sort of moved from Poland and started writing in English, one of the first papers or the first papers I sent to organization studies, I got it back from David Hickson and he said, well, it's all very interesting, but you explain, he explain the phenomenon to yourself. I thought, oh, and what's wrong with that? So I continue, and since then I published quite a few papers in organization studies, even with David Hickson. But, but in a sense, I understand him. I mean, it's not enough to explain to, to yourself, because you have to check it on, the, on, on other people, and proper reviewers are exactly doing this job. But I think that if you don't explain it to yourself first, there's no going further, and it's, you know, uh, quite often I see uh, the sort of theorizing consisting on sort of uh, patching together various abstract concepts that somebody else used and seeing, see? Well, no, I don't see. I would rather have it in sort of your own words, but showing me exactly so that after that I say, ah, now I know something I didn't know before. This is how it works. This is how voluntary organizations in Grenoble are working, or if this is in Grenoble or whatever. So, so that's, I think, the point. And I think that I shouldn't be speaking for you young, young people, but I think you got into panic by this sort of, you know, theoretical uh, requirements. But it also, okay, I will tell you one funny thing. I have a course which follows my book, this, this one, From Field to, to Desk. And it starts and ends with three questions which I borrowed from David Silverman. What do you want to know? Why do you want to know just that? And how are you going to learn about it? So it seems easy peasy, no? But well, in the beginning, uh, they, they are supposed to say it very quickly, uh, very sh briefly, um, talking to me. And they give me like a sort of quotes, which I don't understand, with sort of the abstract language uh, taken from that. I mean, sort of avoiding the, the, the common normal language, is sort of like, you know, uh, I say, to, you know, if you have to explain to your grandmother, say it like that. So, okay, I force them and they do that, and at the end, they're supposed to write an essay which exactly answers these three questions. And what I'm getting is literature review, and I say, don't do literature review, I don't know what you're writing, I mean, I don't know this literature, I cannot offer something. It seems that there is like a block, you cannot say with the simple words, what you, are, what you want to know and why you want to know it. I mean, I said, you know, even answer like, because I'm getting money for that and my advisor wants me to study it. That's okay too. Uh, not in the dissertation, but in a sort of a... Uh, but there is like a resistance that I have to fight and I'm sending them back. I say, well, no, I'm not going to, to read now 20 pages, you know, presenting me with the, all the context that, you know, something. I want to know what you want to know and why. And I think it's interesting because, uh, but I, I, as an ex-psychologist, I, I uh, uh, see it as a sort of anxiety reduction, h hiding behind the sort of a, yeah, abstract words that sound much better than sort of common sense things that, you know, I want to know. Uh, well, as, as the big sociologist said, when Herbert Blumer, what's going on here? Yeah, I'm going to a voluntary organization. What do they do? And so on and so forth. I don't write anything. Okay. I can only see. Okay. Uh, see, these are my, these two, these two in the corner are my screens, and the, on one I see the desk. I mean, desk is a virtual desk. This is what they are doing. I cannot write anything, but I can see what they are doing. 
No, I don't, I don't go home, no. I write my observation, I, I sit here, but they, this is, what I'm observing here is double thing. I'm observing what they are saying, doing, going on, but I'm observing what happens on the screen. And I write down whatever I, I want to write down, but not on the screen, on paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I could do it on the third screen, but, oh, by the way, they're amazing. I don't know how much you can have. I mean, there are two screens on two different computers. They can open like uh, six windows on the same screen, and many of them have th three screens. Amazing multitasking. And why didn't you analyze them earlier on? Okay. We forget this nasty <laughs> question. What was in my research team told that, you know, maybe we should get through it at the end because they didn't want me to start analyzing and then labeling things and being influenced by them. So, anyway. Uh-huh. Tabula rasa. Well, what I suggest to people, because many people are uh, in this situation, uh, pretend that you are doing it. So start analyzing from the first observation and the second, and so, so do chronologically, because, you know, if you confront it all there, you know, you will have no clue, until, un, unless you use some kind of software. But if you want to, to do it sort of uh, in the other way, pretend that you, you go there for the first time and sort of, okay, you will know some things, so what? You will put it in the notes. Yeah, I, as I said, I suggest Rosebud Kante, you count everything as a special category of techniques so that everybody, every reader will be impressed with how many techniques. But as I said, every normal person does it when you go someplace, you do this, you do that, you do all the rest. But, yeah. And formal interview can turn into a chat. Yeah. And the chat could be, and the conversation can turn into e interview because as we are talking, you know, I do have some questions I have to, you know, and so on and so forth. So in the field, all this, this lists, categories, I mean, it's a help, but it, this is not how it works. In the field, everything gets into one another. Thank you.